What's up, Prime fam? We're in my truck, and we're gonna take you guys through my entire squat and deadlift workout. Let's fix this camera. Number one mistake I see so many trainees make in the gym, and this is especially true actually with coaches as well, and that's not me hating on other coaches. I used to make the same mistake early on in my coaching career, and even honestly into my intermediate phase of my coaching career. Um, but that mistake is not setting up long-term sustainability for hard training. The number one factor to get you stronger and bigger is to train really hard. That sounds pretty fucking obvious, yet you would be surprised how many coaches take a systematic approach to an adapting and evolving individual. What I mean by that is you see a lot of coaches and even just trainees who are doing their own programming, um, or even some of you guys who are on our group coaching programs, you guys on the Fusion or SBD program, um, some of you guys make the mistake of selecting your exercises on that program because it is semi-customizable by you guys. You select what you think is going to give you the best carryover all the time or what's going to build the most muscle in certain muscle groups. And that can be a really smart way to design a program or it can actually be a really stupid way to design a program because you need a break on your connective tissues or you need to actually work on some areas that are less specific to your low bar and your conventional deadlifts or whatever your competition style lifts are. Are. And so we're going to walk you guys through my training day today. We're going to take you through my entire squat and deadlift day. And we actually are now in the transition. I am in the transition of going into my strength and a peaking phase. Now I'm not peaking for a meet, so I'm not going to try to hit new one RMs at the end of this training cycle. In fact, this is kind of a comeback training cycle for me, but nonetheless, I am going to do somewhat of a mini peak at some point here just to express some strength and kind of see where I'm at after this long uh, move and kind of detraining phase I had coming out here to North Carolina. Carolina. And this is the same for group coaching members. Right now, they're still in a hypertrophy, weak point, and uh, technical improvement phase where they're working on a lot of their baseline work. In the next four weeks, they're going to transition along similar to me, both on the Fusion and SPD program. They're going to transition into their strength and peaking phase. But when they do that, I would recommend a lot of you guys to listen to what I'm about to talk about today when you're selecting and designing your exercises going through that phase. So um, today, I have high bar squats and conventional deadlifts on a stiff bar using pound plates. Now, you might be saying, why am I doing high bar squats when I'm a low bar squatter? And why am I using a stiff bar on deadlifts when I'm entering my strength and peaking phase? And a lot of coaches would also critique this. A lot of trainees would know, hey, that's not powerlifting specific. That's what you should have done in your you know, hypertrophy phase, right? Or something like that. But the, case, the reality is, is my connective tissues, especially my rotator cuff and lat attachment, all up in here has been on on fire lately. My adductors have been overworked and a lot of this was unfortunately due to me pushing it a little too hard after a detraining phase. Now, woulda, coulda, shoulda, you know, entered my phase a little bit easier, but I didn't. And so now I'm an adapting and evolving system my human body is and I have to create a program around that rather than try to force my body into a program so while systematically when everything's going perfectly it makes a lot of sense to now do more low bar squatting up my frequency on the main competition lifts um, get even more specific on my deadlift so not only keep pulling on a deadlift bar but maybe deadlift twice a week and things like this but that is not sustainable for me to push hard training if I were to continue low bar squats and deadlifts uh, as is is, and actually up my intensity, up my frequency, I would burn out, I would injure something, or I would just have to do a huge deload every two to three weeks. And so in order to push harder training, I'm choosing exercises that are comfortable with my body currently. Now, this isn't sexy, this isn't gonna fucking sell, but look how smooth this high bar squat at 505 pounds on a deload week, so this is an intro week, and look how smooth this single was. It looked like RP5 or so, even with the tempo. I think I could have easily grinded out five more reps here, which would be very close to where my low bar squat is. And that's because I can express more strength when I'm not feeling as beat up. When I was doing my low bar squats recently, my adductors were feeling like they were going to tear off the attachment sites. And again, this was due to me not being responsible in my comeback phase. But what you have to understand, guys, is woulda, coulda, shoulda. It doesn't matter. You're always evolving. You're always adapting. So you need to fit the program to the individual at any given time time. This is why with my one-on-one -on -one coaching, I'm ready to change a program literally at the drop of a hat. I do not worry about, oh, but we need to be more specific in this phase. If my athlete's almost injured, we got to change something. Or 
Let's say my athlete has huge technical problems and even though we were planning to move to a, a strength phase and a peaking phase, I might actually peak them out on an exercise where they're a little bit weaker and maybe it's more quad dominant or whatever it might be in order to further express some strength and build strength in our weaker points to then have long-term carryover to their main competition lift. This is something you do not see in modern powerlifting yet they used to do this all the time back in the day in old school powerlifting. And I don't think it's an antiquated idea. While we have learned and evolved from those times, there's a lot of things you could still learn from yesteryear's best squatters, deadlifters, and benchers of all time. So after my high bar squats, I went on to deadlifts. Now I'm using a stiff bar with pound plates specifically, and you might ask why such a weird combination. So I have always felt more comfortable and more stable, and therefore my connective tissues, especially at that lat and shoulder attachment, which are regularly um, hot spots on me when I'm pulling heavy on a, a deadlift bar, I've always felt way better on a stiff bar. Uh, I wish the non-USAPL and IPF feds would switch to a stiff bar. I think it's silly we have a deadlift bar, and if you want to hear my honest opinion, sumo pullers get way more out of deadlift bars than conventional pullers. So I actually think it's literally putting conventional pullers at a disadvantage. This is why you see a lot of really good pullers in the USAPL and IPF that are both sumo and conventional. Generally speaking, sumo pullers seem to be always ahead of the curve because I think just from a physics standpoint, sumo is easier. People want to fucking argue that, you know, whatever. We can have that debate another time. I actually don't mind sumo being in powerlifting competitions, but I do hate the deadlift bar and even furthermore I've just always felt comfortable on the stiff bar and so right now to have more stability at my lat attachment and in those right rotator cuffs as I'm warming up here on these ascending sets I've decided to pull on a stiff bar because it's gonna feel better likewise the pound plate specifically actually helped me feel enough whip to where when I switch back to the deadlift bar it doesn't feel as aggressive of a, of a transition but not too much whip to where again I'm irritating those tissues so I'm being very specific here and these seem like such minor details to worry about but this is how I can train hard today I was able to build up to 585 pounds from a lower starting position than what I would otherwise be on on my deadlift bar and the, the set moved amazingly after doing ascending sets of four so um, this was actually the healthiest I felt since I moved to North Carolina and I think it's because I finally chose exercises that would just happen to agree with my body right now. Now, there's a potential that I might even just find um, this is really comfortable for long-term progress and maybe I stick to this, we'll see. But I, I'm pretty sure I'm gonna switch back to low bar. I'm pretty sure at some point I'll transition obviously back to training on competition plates. But for now, this gives me a lot of ability. The second thing I'm not afraid to change is I didn't do any back down sets and I don't plan to do back down sets on these exercises anytime soon because I can tell I just don't need it right now. I'm in such a state of detraining still even after you know eight weeks of my move or whatever it's been that um, I think I can get a ton out of just one or two two top sets and I had a conversation with my coach Dylan Smith who he actually we both agree that I'm just such a low volume responder I tend to be one of the freaks in the opposing direction of which we generally think of genetic outliers so I think I get way more out of less now just to continue to walk you guys through the rest of the workout you're gonna notice this workout was not quite as dense as I had been doing previously so um, after my squats and deads, I moved on to some calves exercises and tip raises. Now, I've noticed from years of not training calves and tips because I just don't care about my calf size that much. And I've always known calves grow better from hiking, jump rope and running and things of that nature. And I really do believe that. I know that sounds funny, but I, I think you see the hu most humongous fucking calves in runners and jumpers and, and people who do shit like that. And um, I know when I was running, my calves were literally like 17 inches when I was 155 pounds soaking wet. Like I was a skinny little bastard with humongous fucking calves because I was running like 10 miles a day and they just really respond to high volume. But in this case, what the reason I'm training calves and tips so aggressively is I think one mistake I've made the last few years is forgetting how important the ankles are when it comes to stabilizing your squats, your deadlifts, your other exercises in the lower body. And the reason a lot of my adductor pain 
pain I think comes is from my lack of dorsi and plantar flexion. And so my body has to make up from that range of motion by overly externally rotating and abducting my hips. And of course that's gonna stretch the adductors while they actually contract out of the hole of the squat. And so you're asking for a lot of adductor problems if you don't have properly trained ankles. So I'm actually doing my calf exercises in a slot where a lot of people would put something like a leg press. And in fact, on our group coaching programs, because most of you are not gonna be in my situation, we are for sure doing a little bit more assistance work on the quads and the prime movers of your squats and deadlifts when you transition into this heavy phase. But if you find yourself kind of in a similar situation to me, you might wanna try this. Now, after that, I did a shit ton of leg extensions because again, your squats, they don't really train the distal portion of your quads. Your vastus medialis oblique, which is the teardrop muscle, is really neglected when it comes to your squatting exercises and it leads to chronic knee issues sometimes. And so to be actually preventative right now and to really encourage hypertrophy in my quads, I'm going to be doing a shit ton of leg extension. So I did ascending sets and then three extra working straight sets after the ascending sets to just annihilate my quads on um, something that was really simple with low fatigue threshold. So again, some of you guys are not setting up your program for long-term fatigue management. And what you have to understand is if you're not managing fatigue, you're just gonna get banged up or overworked and you're not gonna be able to, to actually train hard. And so instead of doing something like, a, you know, some kind of leg press or Smith squat or front squats or whatever it may be, for me right now, the best way to gain some size in my legs is actually a leg extension, which has almost no auxiliary fatigue. Okay, there's gonna be a time and a place I do something bigger. After that, I just had some abs and that's pretty much it. Now I know this was a quick video, but what I really wanna hammer home to you guys is that you have to understand sustainability and training fucking hard is the, the two most important things when it comes to your results. If you worry about specificity and what bar you're using and what plates you're training on before you're fucking pushing yourself in the gym, you're ass backwards, my dude, okay? So this video is kind of a rant, kind of a training vlog, uh, kind of just content because I want to post as much content and just give you guys insights as to what I'm doing. Um, as always, guys, go sign up for group coaching programs. If you guys want to help out the channel and just have more content coming, the more group coaching members I get, guys, it's only 45 bucks a month. You get access to all of our, our content on the website, guys. We're producing videos there every single week and the content's only going to get better because I've hired someone to help me with the content. I'm investing your guys' money back into it. And then likewise, you get a kick-ass evolving program that changes every every single season. If you want a free sample, email me at uh, brendan at prime-strength.com. I'll give you guys a free sample of the program to all my subscribers, to all my fam, prime fam. I can't speak. The camera's almost out of memory, guys. I gotta go. I love you guys all. I'll catch you guys in the next video.